Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. And then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father, after he's destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we have arrived at last to the last week in Eastertide. And we've arrived at last um, to the Apostle Paul's confession of the resurrection found here in 1 Corinthians. And it is quite possible that this is one of the earliest statements about Jesus' resurrection ever written down, coming as near as perhaps 20 years to the, the events of Easter. It predates the writings of all the Gospels and of Acts and of Revelation by decades. And we find these words of Paul um, at almost the end of this first letter to the Corinthian church, um, where any good writer and any good speaker knows you put the information of most importance. You put the inform information that you most want people to remember. What I appreciate about Paul, continue to appreciate about Paul, is that he is confessional in his writing. We learn from him not only good theology, <clears throat> not only good theology, that Christ died for our sins and that Christ was raised on the third day and appeared to many people, some of whom are still alive to testify to it. But then we also learn what the resurrection means to Paul personally. It is transformational. It changes everything for him. We, have, we can read about Paul's um, journey of faith in the book of Acts and we spend a good bit of time in Acts um, in this Easter tide, we see how the resurrection transformed the followers of Jesus and how the church spread throughout the world and how Paul was persecuting the early church and then encountered the risen Jesus in a vision on the Damascus Road. And Paul writes about it here. He writes about how he was most unworthy to receive this grace, but this grace found him anyway. <coughs> and it changes him completely. In the church in Corinth, there was a pe apparently some question about um, the resurrection of the dead, what that means, how it works, if it happens. And so Paul writes to them to say, if we believe that Christ was raised from the dead, and he makes it clear in this letter that this is still a recent memory for close to 500 people, if we believe that Christ was raised from the dead, then really anything is possible. 
But if Christ was not raised from the dead, then all is lost. Our faith has been in vain. We are still in our sins, and those who have died have been lost forever, have perished. When Paul uses that word there for lost, for perished in, in your translation, the NRSV, lost elsewhere, he's not using lost like, I've lost my keys, but they're somewhere in the house and I will find them eventually. He, he means utterly lost, destroyed, no longer in existence, like the destruction of a priceless artifact which has been turned to dust and can never be remade again. So we see that for Paul, the resurrection changes everything. I want you to imagine for a moment lifting off in a rocket ship, hurtling through the atmosphere, reaching the soundless immensity of space, and then looking back down on where you've come from, this, this fragile, solitary, small, pale planet. And from this distance, all the things that divide nations, all the things that divide peoples are invisible. And from this shift in perspective, nothing has actually changed, but for you, everything has changed. And you are transformed. And you will spend the rest of your life trying to convince people to lay aside their conflicts and their hatred and their distrust of one another and join together to protect and care for this small ball of life and to protect and care for one another. And the name for this change in perspective is called the overview effect. And it is a real documented cognitive shift. And it has changed the lives of a number of astronaut, astronauts. This is a real thing that happens. And so we, we see in the writing of Paul this kind of transformation, this kind of complete change in perspective, an overview effect caused not by a trip into space, but by Jesus being raised by God from the dead. Paul tells us that the resurrection is the singular life-giving event where, where death dies and the enemies of God are destroyed and all that was broken can be made whole and God's kingdom is revealed. Without the resurrection, we have this disillusioned huddle of Jesus' followers who gather together in secret and remember that he said some good things and he did some good things. And they'd gather together to talk about how he was such a great rabbi and how they thought he was going to overthrow the political powers of the day that oppressed them and, and retake the throne of David and drive out Israel's enemies. But without the resurrection, the story ends there. That is it. It is because of the resurrection that we, that you, that we are here today. The only reason that we are here today is because of the resurrection. Shirley Guthrie, who authored the best-selling text, Christian Doctrine, which we used um, as our guide for our Theology 101 class, writes about the resurrection. He writes, without faith in a risen and living Christ, there would be no Christianity. There would be no Christianity. It was not Jesus' ethical teaching or his example or his noble death that gave birth to the Christian church and made it spread. It was the news of his resurrection. So we have seen that it was only because they first believed in a risen Christ that those first Christians looked back to ask about the meaning of his birth and his life and his death. On Easter Sunday, we called out to one another, Christ is risen, and we called back, he is risen indeed, but why does that matter? So what? It means that Every enemy has been defeated, every enemy. The things that terrify us, the things that keep us awake at night, the shame or the remorse we feel, all our doubts, all our uncertainties, our anger, our sorrow, the voices in our heads that tell us that we have failed or that we are not good enough, none of these things, none of these things has the final victory. None of these things is more powerful than God's power to bring life and hope and peace Nothing, not even death, not even death, the final enemy of God. 
None of these things will win. So how do we live differently because of this? What it, we need an overview effect of our own. In all aspects of life, in our parenting, in our, our families, in our friendships, at our jobs, in our schools, we, we hold on to grace and we hold on to resurrection. We hold on to the truth that God makes all things new. <coughs> that God brings dead things back to life. That there is nothing more powerful than God and the resurrection changes us now, changes us now. Even as we hope for God's future. Amen. We now have the opportunity to commission members of our pastor nominating committee. Um, they are being commissioned at, at, at each service, um, that they, they, the service that they attend. So several were commissioned this morning at 8.30, several were at Newstone. So for those members who have not been commissioned, you don't have to do it more than once, is what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> please, please come up and join us in the front. One of the congregation's privileges is to elect uh, their pastor and associate pastors. And uh, welcome, we have uh, Josie and Mark uh, and Don. And let's say I saw June was at here at the 8.30 service, right? Mm -hmm. We stand facing the, uh, and Sarah, okay. Four now, I've seen seven. We probably have three, hopefully, two or three earlier at 8.30. Bill Lawrence was at, uh, commissioned at 7.30, and then we had uh, Dave Tallman and um, Barry Moorfield at the Newstone Gathering. John, Mark, Josie, Sarah. Friends, you have been chosen by the congregation of First Presbyterian Church of Winchester to serve as the pastor nominating committee. This is a position of trust and confidence as you seek to find the next person to propose to this congregation as its next installed pastor. In the presence of this congregation, you accept this position on the pastor nominating committee. We seek to serve with an attitude of patience, discernment, and hope, relying always upon God's guidance. Will you consider all persons fairly, knowing that God may surprise you with an opportunity you might not have considered? And will you pray constantly, seeking the will of God for this congregation? And then some questions for you. Will you uphold members of the pastor nominating committee with your prayers and words of encouragement? If so, please answer, we will. Will you respect their need to work in confidentiality, trusting their judgment, and patiently awaiting their decision? If so, please answer, we will. We will. Let us pray. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us, and by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading Sarah, June, Mark, Bill, Barry, Cindy, Josie, Dave, Courtney, and Don to their ministry on the pastor nominating committee. We pray they may grow in this ministry in faith, hope, and love as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much. As we come to prayer, uh, I have notes, I think, from the early service today for um, Roger Rector and uh, wife Lisa. Um, request uh, struggling with terminal cancer. And also for Dustin Whitmer and family on the death of Dustin's brother. 
We're also kind of we remember always, of course, the Eisenhower family, uh, with the death of Steve, took place last Sunday morning. And continue prayers for uh, Brookie Phillips. Uh, but good news is she's moved out of critical care onto the fourth floor of Winchester Medical. Let us pray. O oh God of peace, you've told your disciples that our hearts not be troubled or afraid. Please be with those who are troubled, those who are low in spirit because they are fighting so many dangers in life. We hope your presence will be with those who are are going through grief, loss. And the news we would pray for those who are leaving the fires in Alberta, leaving their homes behind. We pray for peace in Syria and an end to the continued killings that have been going on there and closer to home and end to shootings in schools and shopping centers a needless death that goes on in our communities Lord comfort all those who are in danger we lift up these families who are fighting hard times. And you are God to our God of nurture. We thank you this day in nurturing us. For you are a gracious God who has adopted us into your family through the miracle of your grace, calling us to be brothers and sisters. But today we are here, loving God, because we give you thanks for our mothers. Mothers who cared for us when we were helpless, who comforted us when we were hurt, whose love and care we often took for granted. We also remember those who are grieving the loss of their mother, those who never knew the biological mother and may yearn for her, those who have experienced the wonder of an adopted mother's love. Lord, give them special blessings. But as we pray, we'd also pray for comfort to all moms, for those who are tired, stressed, for those who struggle to balance the tasks of work and family, for those who are unable to feed their children due to poverty, for those whose children have physical, mental, or emotional disabilities. For those who have children they do not want. For those who raise children on their own. For those who have lost a child. For those who care for the children of others. We pray for those mothers whose children have left home to go to school or go on in life. We pray for those who desire to be a mother and that has not been fulfilled. Bless all mothers. Bless all mothers that their love may be deep and tender and that they may lead their children to know and do what is good not living for themselves alone, but for you, O oh God, 
and for their brothers and sisters around the world. Gracious God, hear this and all our prayers, along with the prayer we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. The power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. And for the gifts of Jesus' life, resurrection, and ascension, 
for the privilege of offering our fruits, the fruits of our hands. Let's give thanks to God for what we have this day.
Let us pray. Gracious and giving God, you are the one who first has given to us all that we need for life. God is now to use what we have gathered for the well-being of your church, for those in need of shelter and food, for all who suffer for want of your word, and for nurturing faith in your people. In the name of Christ Jesus our Lord, amen. And now go in safety, for you cannot go where God is not. Go now in love, for love alone endures. Go now with purpose, and God will honor your dedication. Go now in peace, for it is the gift of God to those whose hearts and minds are in Christ Jesus. Amen.